So friends, I want to begin today by plumbing the depths of that ancient wisdom. I'm talking about that, that ancient, ancient wisdom that dates all the way back to the year of our Lord, 1987. Now, if you were alive on January 14th of that year, happened to be a Wednesday, uh, then it is possible, it is very possible that in the morning, when you were done feathering your hair, after you had put on your Jordache jeans, after you had pulled on your single leather glove, a la the king of pop himself, Michael Jackson, may he rest in power. That's how you all dressed, right? That's... It is very possible that after you got ready in the morning, you went and you picked up your daily paper and you saw this four-panel comic from none other than Kelvin and Hobbes. Panel one. Kelvin says to his tiger friend Hobbes, I feel bad that I called Susie names and hurt her feelings. Panel two. Kelvin continues, I'm sorry I did it. Panel three, Hobbes the tiger responds. He suggests, maybe you should apologize to her. Panel number four, Kelvin says, I keep hoping there's a less obvious solution. So in the situation presented in this comic, it is abundantly clear to all of us what Kelvin needs to do, right? He needs to go and he needs to apologize to Susie for calling her names. He needs to say, I'm sorry, and he needs to make amends with her. And yet, Kelvin is not only hesitant to apologize, but in fact, he is trying to do everything except apologize. And the reason this comic is both funny and unfunny at the same time, the reason that it falls for us into the category of ancient wisdom, is that this comic is shining light not on how children behave, but it is in fact shining light on how adults behave. Because remember back to when, when we all were just little guffers, back to when we were in kindergarten. If you were raised by even semi-competent adults, then when they got wind that you had hurt someone, be it emotionally, physically, what have you, but when they got wind that you had hurt someone, they would immediately demand that you go and say sorry to the person that you wronged. And if you were raised by fully competent adults, they would also be there to listen in on that apology and ensure that it was an actual apology and not a, a non-apology apology like, I'm sorry you're such a whiner and that you had to go tattle off me. We've all heard that apology. We've all given that apology. But then, but then we got a little bit older, didn't we? and our capacity for, for logic and reasoning expanded, as did our capacity to, to rationalize and explain away our bad behavior and weasel out of making amends to those that we have wronged. And this is true to the extent that, that we adults when we hurt someone nowadays, we are far more likely to blame them to say it was their fault for letting us hurt them than we are for actually offering them an apology. Just like Kelvin, right? We want to do anything, anything, anything at all but own up to the mistake that we made. Now that is a far, far cry from how we were taught to behave as children. And as we read this morning, it is a far far cry from how Jesus wishes that his followers would live their lives as well. 
So this morning's passage, I think, can be summed up nicely with the phrase shock and awe. Shock and awe. Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, chop it off. If your foot causes you to sin, says Jesus, hack that sucker off too. If your eye causes you to sin, says Jesus, what are you waiting for? Gouge, he says. That's a word choice for you. Gouge it out. And God help you. God help you, says Jesus, should you cause a child to go astray? Because if that is the case, then it it, it is better for you. It would be preferable for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and for you to be thrown into the ocean. Right? So to say the, the very, very least, this passage is intense. This passage is startling. And it is made even the more startling because these are not the words of some obscure Old Testament prophet. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself. So here I want to put your mind at ease a little bit. And I think it will give you great comfort to know that even the staunchest biblical literalists out there, folks who believe that the Bible was written word for word by God God's self, even biblical literalists, when reading this passage, and and also that that passage where Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you first have to sell all your possessions. Uh, But when reading this passage, even the staunchest biblical literalists look beyond the face value of Jesus' words to the deeper meaning behind them. And the deeper meaning behind them, I think, I think that in this passage, Jesus is using hyperbole to emphasize the need for his followers to lead lives of radical self-honesty. In this passage, Jesus is commending to us a way of life in which we are able to really look at ourselves, both our actions and the motivations underlying those actions, and, and, and when we're looking at ourselves and we, we see something that we've done or we see something within us that has fallen short of the standard of love, don't deny it. Don't defend it. Don't rationalize it. Don't equivocate about it. No, says Jesus. Admit it, or as we like to say in the church, confess it, and then take bold and decisive action to change it preferably before it gets to the point where you need to chop off an appendage. If you hurt someone, Jesus is saying, don't be like Calvin. Rather, just say, I'm sorry, and then do the work that you need to do, whatever it is. Maybe it's therapy. Maybe you have to go do community service. I don't know what it is, but go do the work you need to do to make sure that you don't make that mistake again. It's how you were taught to act back in kindergarten. And it is also how Jesus hopes his followers will act today. This passage is really as simple as that. But the crazy thing about it is that this way of of life that Jesus commends to us today uh, is a way of life, I think, that not only Christians can get behind, but it's also a way of life that I believe that that non-Christians and even anti-Christians can get behind. This way of life in which we we couple radical honesty with bold and decisive transformation. Now, why do I I feel comfortable standing up here and saying that? That even non-Christians, anti-Christians will buy into that? Well, I feel comfortable because I am a frequenter of an online forum called Am I the Jerk? Am I the jerk? For those of you who are are internet savvy, it's actually uh, a subreddit. Uh, And if you want to Google this after church, you need to know that they don't actually use the word jerk. 
They use a synonym for the word jerk that begins with A, ends with all. It is not appropriate for a wholesome family context such as this. Uh, but what this forum is, uh, uh, people come to this forum seeking a judgment on some situation in their lives in which they're not sure if they were the jerk or not. So what they do, they, they, they present their case as, as objectively as possible, and then they turn it over to thousands of internet strangers who weigh in with a verdict, you are a jerk or you are not a jerk. Now, it needs to be said that, that the, the forum on which the, this, or the site, rather, that this forum appears on is, is Reddit, uh, which by and large has this kind of new atheist, anti-Christian vibe to it. Uh, while there's some, there are some explicit forums on the site dedicated to Christianity and theology and that sort of thing, uh, most of the time when, when people are talking about Christianity on the site, they are talking about it condescending. Uh, to be fair, though, if your only exposure to Christianity is the kind of corporate, evangelical, homophobic, misogynistic kind of Christianity, okay, that's understandable why you would be looking down. Uh, but even on this kind of new atheist, anti-Christian site, the most beloved posts on this forum, the most upvoted posts, the most commented posts on these forums are the ones in which the person seeking a verdict cleaves most closely to the teaching of Jesus in today's passage. So they get the verdict that they are a jerk, and rather than denying it, rather than rationalizing it, rather than equivocating about it, they take bold and decisive actions to change how they are living and make amends with the person they have hurt. So I'm not going to leave you hanging. I actually I brought an example here with me today. Um, a lot of these, they go on and on at length because they provide a lot of like background detail into personal relationships and whatnot. Uh, so I had to pick one that was more succinct than those, um, <clears throat> but it's still in the most popular 100 posts over the past year. Uh, and also, given that we're coming into moving season, I thought this one was particularly appropriate. Uh, so I'm actually going to read it to you because uh, it's written in first person and it's pretty great. <clears throat> My girlfriend, a 23-year-old female, and I, a 24-year-old male, just moved in together. I moved into her apartment that she had shared with her roommate before I moved in. So the apartment was half furnished since her roommate took half of everything. I lived in an incredibly small bachelor-style studio, so the only things I really had was a queen bed, a couch that my girlfriend hated, and a TV. We agreed to keep my bed and bed frame since she had a full. She, she suggested we go to Ikea to restock the house, and she was super excited about it. When we got there, she filled our entire cart with furniture, kitchen, and bathroom stuff. She was asking my opinion on stuff, and I was happy to give it, but I saw the bill racking up pretty quickly. She ended up getting so much stuff that I saw as pointless, like bathroom rugs, a soap dispenser, a dresser even though she already has one. She got a second matching side table for my side of the bed, some art for the apartment, and get this, two giant rugs, one for the bedroom and one for the living room. And this is just some of the stuff I didn't think we needed. There was plenty more. We ended up having two full carts of stuff, and before we even went to checkout, she said, everything else we need, we can just get on Amazon. <laughs> I was genuinely in shock that she thought we needed even more than all of this stuff. But we went to checkout, and just like I thought, the total was almost $1,400. She asked the cashier if we could split the bill halfway on two cards, and I was horrified. I told her no way was I paying for half of all this. She looked surprised, and quickly we began to argue. She told me this was for the both of us, but I disagreed and said I didn't need half of this stuff. After about five minutes of arguing and holding up the line, she paid and we left. The entire hour ride home, we argued, and when we got home, I was given the silent treatment 
after being called a cheap jerk. So, Reddit, am I the jerk here? So those of you who think this guy is being the jerk, please raise your hand. Those of you who do not think he's being a jerk, please raise your hand. Okay, well, the vast majority of the internet uh, agrees with the vast majority of the congregation. They thought this guy was a jerk to the tune of 4,000 judgments telling him as much and 12,500 upvotes on the site, just indicating that people thought this was an entirely entertaining situation. So after receiving this verdict from these internet, these kind internet strangers, uh, the kid updated his post with four sentences. Uh, this is what he said. He said, after reading many of your comments, I apologize to my girlfriend and Venmoed her for the half. But as of now, I am currently in trouble because she actually saw this post. Ha ha. Thanks for the judgment and making me see the light. Friends, what, what this young man did is not what Kelvin would have done. No, it is not. It's not what most adults would have done. But it is, in fact, what Jesus himself would have done. And I pray... I pray it may also be what we would have done and what we will do in the future. Amen. Amen.